Hello, uh, my name is Claire Davis. Uh, I use she and her as my pronouns, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about looking where we cannot see, using infrared light to reveal the secrets of planet formation. I am happy to take questions at the end of the talk um, or at a later date via Twitter. Uh, you'll find me at Tough as C, uh, and that handle will be written at the bottom of all my slides in case you miss it. As we're in weird times and I cannot give you this talk in person, I wanted to include a slide to introduce myself to you all. Uh, I've been employed as, the, as a research fellow in the astrophysics group at the University of Exeter for just shy of five years now. Uh, and prior to that, I spent four years working towards a PhD in astronomy at the University of St Andrews. Uh, this photo on the left was taken a few years back uh, on one of my trips to professional telescopes around the world. Uh, this one in particular is in Hawaii, and I was using the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, which is housed in that building behind me in the picture. Um, in addition to my work as a research fellow, um, I'm passionate about improving equality, diversity and inclusion in science, technology, engineering, maths and medicine, collectively referred to as STEM. Um, as part of this, I'd like to highlight what may not necessarily be obvious for some, to some people, uh, and that is that I identify as a uh, gay lass. And this consequently outs myself, I suppose, as Northern, um, as well as a member of the LGBTQ plus community um, in the process. Um, I actually run a network uh, within Exeter for LGBTQ plus STEM professionals and students, and this is called PRISM. Uh, the website of PRISM uh, is now shown on the screen uh, in blue at the bottom. Um, and PRISM aims to celebrate uh, the diverse work done within STEM, as well as raise the vis visibility of the diverse range of people who work in the sector. With the introductions to myself um, out of the way, let's get an idea of what I'm going to be talking about. I'll be providing a bit of background to some of the astronomical concepts that I'm going to be covering, just so we're all on the same page when I get to the more detailed stuff later on. Uh, the first concept I'll be introducing is the link between colour and temperature. Afterwards, I'll guide you through an overview of how stars form. I'll show you why studying planet formation requires us to use light, which we cannot see with our eyes. And I'll detail two techniques which I personally use to do this in my research. These are known as scattered light imaging and near-infrared H-band interferometry. In all of what I cover in this talk, I'll be discussing more of the methodology than our findings, thus highlighting some of the amazing tech my colleagues and I use for our science. So let's get started by having a look at the light that we can see, the visible light. We're generally used to the idea of light being made up of colours. We most commonly see this when sunlight diffracts through raindrops and produces a rainbow, for example. This image here shows the same effect using a glass prism rather than a raindrop. The white light shines onto the prism from this direction. Some reflection happens over here. A shadow is cast by the glass here, and we can see the full spectrum of colour via diffraction over here. But instead of thinking in terms of colour, physicists and astronomers think about light as a wave, with colour reflecting differences in frequency or wavelength. Red light is lower frequency and longer wavelength light, while violet light is higher frequency and shorter wavelength light. The colours that we can see with our eyes make up just a tiny fraction of all the wavelengths of light, all the spectrum. Beyond violet, we've got ultraviolet, or UV for short, uh, we've got X-rays, and we've got gamma rays, and some of these terms uh, are probably recognisable to you uh, in other forms. Beyond red, in the other direction, we've got infrared, microwave and radio. And again, these words are probably not new to you, uh, but the concept that they are parts of the, uh, the spectrum of light might necessarily be. It's quite interesting before we move on to consider why this might be. Why are our eyes sensitive to only a small window of the full spectrum of light? One thing is certain, it has maximized our sensitivity to sunlight. To help explain this, imagine for a moment that I gave you a series of detectors that were each able to collect a different wavelength of sunlight. For ease of illustration, let's use this tray as an example detector. This tray is able to catch wavelengths of sunlight between 400 and 900 nanometers, i.e. the visible light. It filters out all of the rest of the light. In a given length of time, it catches some photons of sunlight. This second tray that I give you only catches ultraviolet light. Any other photons of light, it's just going to pass by it. 
In the same amount of time that we gave the visible tray to catch the light, it doesn't catch nearly as many photons of light. And finally, I give you a third tray. This catches infrared light. And if we give it the same amount of time to catch photons of infrared light as the other two trays had to catch their portions of the spectrum of light, then it catches, uh, it collects more photons in the same amount of time compared to the UV tray, but still fewer photons than the visible tray. And this is all related to the wavelength dependence of the sun's power output. The maximum power output of the sun occurs across the visible portion of the spectrum of light. The spectral energy distribution of the sun shows this more clearly um, without the need for inbox tray emojis. Here uh, in this plot shown on the screen, um, we have the spectral irradiance of the sun split by light wavelength displayed on the y-axis. And this is shown against the wavelength of the light on the x-axis. What you can see is that the sun is at maximum spectral irradiance across the visible portion of the spectrum. Furthermore, as the different parts of the graph show, this is independent of whether you're at sea level or above the Earth's atmosphere. It's something that is intrinsic to the sun. But why is this the case, you may ask? Well, the peak wavelength of a star's power output is inversely related to its temperature. The sun's surface is about 6,000 degrees, and so its spectral energy distribution peaks across the visible portion of the spectrum. Hotter stars are more blue, and cooler stars are more red. We can actually see this dependence of colour on temperature when we light a candle. And here's just a picture of a candle that I took from the internet. Close to the, close to the wax, um, where the flame is hottest, it appears blue. While further up the wick, um, where the flame is cooler, it has a more orange colour. By building and using detectors that are sensitive to different wavelengths, astronomers can study hotter or cooler material and similarly, more or less energetic phenomena. And this is particularly useful for star formation. And before we dive straight into how stars are formed, it's probably useful for us all to have an idea of what a star is to make sure we're all on the same level again. Uh, this image on the left here features the sun, our closest star. It was taken just a few months ago back in June by the Solar Orbiter Probe. Stars, like the Sun, are burning balls of plasma. The temperatures and pressures achieved in the cores of stars are substantial enough that the star is able to effectively squash hydrogen atoms together to make helium. This process is known as nuclear fusion. It releases tons of energy and allows the core of the star to support the weight of the outer layers of the star, thus remaining fairly static in shape. But stars don't have infinite supplies of hydrogen. They live and they die just like you and I. The sun, for instance, is about halfway through its reservoir of hydrogen, enough to keep it shining for roughly another four and a half billion years, so nothing for us to worry about. The ability to fuse hydrogen into helium is what we use to define a star. If we're looking at how stars are formed, we thus need to consider the conditions in the protostar before the fusion was able to take place. Now, we know um, that fusion requires high temperatures and high pressures and thus high densities. So the protostar must have been less dense and cooler. And by simply rewinding this idea further and further back in time, we can arrive at the idea that stars form from the gravitational collapse of large expanses of cool gas. A colleague of mine at the University of Exeter runs simulations of gravitational collapse in these molecular clouds. They're called molecular clouds due to their cool temperatures. Um, in essence, they are cool enough for hydrogen atoms to form bonds with other hydrogen atoms, meaning the majority of material in the cloud is molecular rather than atomic. These smooth particle hydrodynamic simulations, or SPH simulations for short, are coded in Fortran 90. This coding language is used by computational astronomers due in part because of its speed, but also because the codes are often pr the product of decades of development. Each of the SPH particles in this simulation is assigned a mass and a velocity, and the code follows what happens as these particles interact due to gravity. So just before I press play, I'll give you a note about what you're seeing. The colors that you'll see are used to highlight the different densities. Black regions are devoid of material. Red regions are sparse, and yellow regions are the most dense. Once a density exceeds a particular value within a certain area or volume, 
a sink particle is created in the code. You'll see these looking like beads. These illustrate where individual protocilla cores have formed in the simulation. There is also a timer in the top right of the video, which shows the time scales over which this process is happening. So I'll let this play and you can see what happens. You can see the first cause, or the, the sink particles being produced now towards the, the, the bottom of the simulation, shooting out as beads. And now there's the cluster of them forming towards the center of the simulation. To follow what happens in each of the sink particles or the protostellar cores, we'll switch to a cartoon shown here. Uh, the step shown in the video I just showed you uh, is illustrated in this top se se section. Here, the molecular cloud is illustrated as a blue cloud with individual condensations forming in it, each shown as gray blobs for want of a better term. The zoom in section in this top panel shows a cross section through one of these blobs. We see that it's roughly spherical in shape and is broken down into three parts the central core shown in yellow, the surrounding envelope shown in gray, which is undergoing spherical infall onto the core, and that's illustrated by the blue arrows. And there's also a bipolar outflow shown in orange towards the top and the bottom of the core. In the next stage, the turbulent motions present in the cloud, which we saw in the video, induce a rotation in the collapsing core. In the balance between centrally focused collapse and this rotation, the collapse is directed onto a plane perpendicular to the axis of rotation. And this produces a disk of material surrounding the core. Moving down to the next panel, the envelope eventually dissipates and we're left with a protostar and a circumstellar disk. This zoom in at the bottom of this panel shows what look like red elephant ears on the star. These indicate the magnetic field of the star which is huge at this time, and which plays an important role in regulating the accretion of disk material onto the star. And moving down to the final two panels, we'll look at the top section first. The disk uh, then starts to dissipate due to the continued accretion, but also due to uh, evaporation, due to high energy radiation from the central core, uh, and also the accumulation of disk material into planets. The cartoon shows the corresponding gap between the central core and its disk. And during this time, the disk is known as a transition disk, as it transitions between being there and not being there. Astronomers sure are inventive when they come up with names for some things. Finally, once the disk is dissipated, we're left with our star and our planetary system. But Claire, how do the planets form? I hear you ask. Well, that is exactly what my research hopes to help us understand. We know that planet formation takes place in circumstellar disks. So peering into some star forming regions and taking a look at some disks is probably a good place for us to start. We'll start with one of the star forming regions in the constellation of Orion. Many of you will be familiar with at least the name of this constellation, even if that's just thanks to the film Men in Black. The Orion constellation dominates the UK skies during the winter months, so you might have even seen the constellation and be familiar with it in that way. This image on the left here is a screenshot from a piece of software called Stellarium, and I've lowered the limiting magnitude so that the number of stars is roughly what we would expect to see from central Exeter with the naked eye. The moon is also uh, shown to give a, the constellation a sense of scale, so you can see it's, it's huge in comparison. I've illustrated where the main part of the constellation is by drawing lines between the stars, and you should be able to see them flashing on the screen. If we go somewhere darker, such as up onto the moors, um, we'll see a lot more stars. This image on the right was taken on Exmoor uh, and shows the same area of sky. So you can still see the constellation just without the lines drawn between it now. The first thing I want to point out to you here is the colours. Uh, these are true colours. You can see that the star to the top left of Orion, which I've got flashing now, um, is a different colour to the bottom right star, 
The top bright star is Betelgeuse. It's an old star which is relatively cool and appears redder. The bottom star is Rigel. It's a hot star and appears bluer. But Orion is host to a number of different star forming regions, as well as these um, different coloured stars. And we're going to focus on the star forming region in the constellation Sword, which is here. If we point a telescope at Orion's sword, we'll be able to see the Orion Nebula. This image on the left was taken with the Hubble Space Telescope of this region. Uh, this is a false colour image uh, produced by imaging the Orion Nebula through different filters across the visible part of the spectrum and stacking them together in post-processing. Uh, and this is our stellar, stellar nursery. This area of sky is home to around 3,000 baby stars. And because of the amazing angular resolution and sensitivity of Hubble, we can zoom into this region and see individual disks or systems comprising disks and their envelopes. Some of these structures have a tadpole-like structure uh, with a bright end and a dark tail. You can see some of these in the panels. The bright end points towards the hot O and B type stars at the center of the nebula, whereas the dark tails are then in relative shadow other panels look more like dark lanes. There's not much more of a feature to them. Uh, and these are actually the individual disks, uh, which we saw earlier illustrated in the cartoon. But the main thing that we can see about these disks is that they're dark. As I say, they're, they're quite featureless in the, in the panels. And that's because they're completely opaque in visible light. They're, they're not shining. And this, in turn, is because the disks are just too cold they don't emit enough light across visible wavelengths. If we look at this cartoon of the spectral energy distribution of protostars and their disks, just as we had a look at the spectral energy distribution of the sun a few slides ago, then while the central protostellar core shines across the visible, shown by the hatched lines, there is an excess of infrared emission compared to what we saw for the sun earlier on. And this infrared excess is all light from the disk. I can also show you from some actual data here as well. Uh, so these, these plots now appearing on screen have got individual data points on them. I've developed a piece of software which accesses various online astronomical archives and pulls together observations of a young star in its disk across all available wavelengths and produces these plots of the spectral energy distribution. And these show the relative brightness of the object at different wavelengths. Uh, the code itself uh, is written in Python uh, and is available to download as a research or an educational tool from the address shown in the image credit at the bottom of the screen. In both of the cases shown here on, on the right of the screen, uh, the double peaked shape is prominent as in the cartoon. So to better study these disks and, and understand how planets form within them, we need to move to longer wavelengths, to light our eyes cannot see. One technique we can use is scattered light imaging. If we take our telescope, say the Gemini Observatory, for example, shown here, and we point it at a young star in its disk, which we've just got here on the slide. Uh, we've got a cross section of the, the star in its disk just to illustrate this. Then some of the, the light we receive at the telescope will come direct from the star. Some of it will come direct from the disk before being observed at the telescope and some of the light will scatter from the star off the disk, and then we observe it at the telescope. The fact that some of the light is scattered is really useful because scattered light has different properties to non-scattered light. When light scatters off a non-metallic medium, it becomes polarised, and we can separate out the polarised from the non-polarised light with custom-built optics at the site of the telescope and specially designed data processing software, which we use and develop here in Exeter. This leaves us with an image of just the light that underwent scattering. And by just isolating the scattered light received at the telescopes, we get images like this. Uh, these are false color images of the circumstellar disks. Uh, the color and scale are selected by the user in post-processing to better highlight the lower and higher intensity regions. In the top image, we have a bright central region with a gap and then an outer ring of, of, of emission. It is possible that gaps like these seen here 
have been carved out by planets forming in the disk. In the bottom image, we see a bright ring that looks almost fluffy. These, uh, there are also arcs um, that you can see around this ring, which extend out outwards, almost like in a spiral pattern. And, and these, these spiral features can be formed when a, when a particular region of the disk becomes unstable to its own self-gravity. And condensations of material are formed, maybe planets or maybe small uh, lower mass stars. So while we cannot see the planets directly in, this Im in these images, we can infer their presence. Um, but to, to give you an idea of, of, of scale, um, just, just to summarize, I suppose the, the, the structures in these images are, are, are huge. Um, the planets that would be detected in, in these types of observations would have orbits on the scale of Neptune um, or wider. And Neptune is the outermost planet in our solar system. So, so these, these planets would be on the scale of our solar system um, or, or even larger. And so they're, they're vastly different worlds to what we're used to. And if we want to understand how planets like those in our own solar system form and, up and evolve, we need to probe closer to the star. Uh, and this in turn requires higher angular resolution. And that actually requires a brief chat about sky angles. Uh, so let's segue, just a sec. Um, astronomers tend to deal with minutes or seconds of arc as units of angle, and these are fractions of a degree. So just like there are 60 minutes in an hour, there are 60 arc minutes in a degree. And just as there are 60 seconds in a minute, there are 60 arc seconds in an arc minute. We can use the full moon to get an idea of scale. Um, so the, the full moon subtends a sky angle of half a square degree. So this is roughly equivalent uh, to the area of sky you block out. If you hold your uh, thumb at arm's length, it's roughly equivalent to the size of your thumbnail held at that distance. And you can test that out next time we have a, uh, a full moon. One arc minute is more akin to the size of this crater now shown on the um, slide. And one arc second is a further 60 times smaller than that. I, I can't show that on the slide, it's just tiny. So we're talking like really tiny areas of the sky. The resolving power of a telescope depends on the size of its primary mirror. And bigger telescope uh, mirrors can obtain better resolution. The telescope used to obtain those scattered light images I showed uh, you a few slides ago belongs to a class of telescopes with eight meter primary mirrors. So these are, these are huge things. And the resolution we can achieve with this type of telescope is around 0 0.05 arc seconds. Even though this sounds small, based on what I've just told you about the size of the moon, it, it's still not small enough to probe the main planet for main regions of the disks. Um, to probe the regions of the disk where we expect planets like the Earth to form, we need to build bigger. And this is just exactly what some astronomers are doing. Um, this here, uh, shown on, on the right, is a mock-up of the European Southern Observatory's so-called extremely large telescope. There go astronomers and they're naming again. Um, and this is presently being built in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Quite handily um, in this figure, they've actually shown the tower holding Big Ben in London for scales. So you can get an idea of the, the vast size of these things. Uh, the primary mirror of this telescope is a whopping 30 metres in diameter. And these provide resolutions down to 0 0.01 arc seconds. So five times smaller than we had previously. But um, this telescope and, and others like it, which are also being planned and, and built, come at a major financial expense. They're, they're really expensive to build. There is another way, however, um, which has the added benefit of being cheaper. If we combine telescopes into an array, the resolution is then related to the distance separating the telescopes rather than the size of the individual telescopes themselves. And we have ourselves an interferometer. In my research, I predominantly use two interferometers, the Chara Array at Mount Wilson in California, shown here on the left, and the Very Large Telescope Interferometer in Chile, shown here on the right. Uh, Chara is comprised of six telescopes, shown here in circles, and each of these have uh, one, meter, uh, one meter diameter primary mirrors. Um, I've circled them in part because they're not the only telescopes on the, on the mountain, so you can easily miss them uh, in the figure 
the VLTI um, with the very large telescope interferometer is um, is equipped with two sets of four telescopes. Uh, the smaller eight me- one point eight meter telescopes are shown in these circles, and the larger eight meter telescopes are highlighted by these arrows. So I've spent the past three years in Exeter on the commissioning team for what's called the Merck X instrument, and we've installed this at Chara. Uh, so the, the the array on on the on the left, uh, and this instrument is an upgrade to the original Merck. And Merck was, was groundbreaking. It was the first six telescope beam combiner in existence, uh, and Merck X has has taken over its mantle as the only instrument capable of combining the light from all six Chara telescopes. Um, but I need to give you some information about why the number of telescopes is important. So let's do another segue, really. Um, an image, the, the, uh, the number of telescopes is, is, is important because it's all linked to the information that interferometers actually provide. With a standard telescope, you obtain an image, albeit with limited resolution, just as we discussed. We've got this, this blurry image that we'd obtain with our sim- single standard telescope. With an interferometer, we don't sample the entire image plane. It's, instead, um, we, we might get a higher resolution observation, but we only get information about a part of the image. So if we take a snapshot with a two-telescope interferometer, we don't sample all that much of the image. So we're really not that much wiser about what we're seeing. Um, but if we then kind of go to our six-telescope interferometer, we can better sample the image plane. And from this sampling, we can piece together the information in a way which allows us to make informed inferences about what we're seeing, which in our example that I keep showing here is a tiger uh, among some some long grass. Of course, we're not going to be observing these with the telescopes. It was just a, a handy image to use for this illustration. There's still some parts of this image, even though we've taken this image with our six telescope interferometer uh, that we're completely oblivious to. Uh, For instance, we couldn't rule out the presence of a smaller creature, like for instance, a dragonfly uh, being present in the image. Uh, But we can still get a good idea of the overall picture. In reality, what we see in the lab at the observatory is not an image. Uh, Building an image from interferometric observations is a complex procedure. What we see in the lab is in fact something like this. Uh, This is known as a waterfall plot. The six Chara telescopes provides 15 independent telescope pairings. So we have the 15 independent measurements in the panels that we see here. We've got three, five rows of three. The x-axis in each of these panels is time. So for each panel, the most recent, recent measurement is shown on the left. And what you're seeing is an evolution of the measurements in each panel. So it's a stream of data, and then that's kind of what it gives it its name as a waterfall plot. So let's just focus on one panel, and in particular, just one measurement. If we take a vertical slice out of this and flatten it out, uh, what we are looking at here is an interference pattern, otherwise known as a fringe packet. The bright white parts of the waterfall plot on the left trace the location of the peak of the envelope of these fringe packets, i.e. the broadest part of the wavy line in this figure on the right. As the Merkex team, we've developed our own data reduction software to take these data recordings and extract useful information, namely the visibility and its phase. The visibility is a measure of the contrast between successive peaks in the interferogram while the phase is a measure of the path difference of the light between the source and the detector. Shown here are some example data that come out of the reduction and calibration procedure. This is actually preliminary data for a protostar called HD 283571, which I observed with Merkex last year. Along the y-axis is the visibility, while along the x-axis is the baseline or the telescope separation. Because we're using data from six telescopes, the data span a range of baseline separations. The colors of the data represent different wavelengths in each measurement, where the gradient from blue to green follows the shortest to the longest wavelengths, respectively. But there's only a small change in wavelength across the data, 
all of these data are observed in a colour of infrared light known as near-infrared H-band. If we retrieve the spectral energy distribution for this protostar, like we did for some others earlier on, this is what we get. Um, the double-peaked feature isn't as pronounced here as it was for the previous examples, uh, but this section here uh, is light from the star, uh, while the rest is the excess emission coming from the circumstellar disk. The near-infrared H-band colour is around here, so we're tracing a, a bit of the disk and a bit of the stellar emission with our Merkex observations. And to better understand what we're seeing, since we don't have an image to work for from, we just have this, this data shown on the, on the left, I actually build models of stars and their disks using a, a Monte Carlo radiative transfer code. Using a range of parameters for the star and its disk that I define, um, this code builds a disk around a star and iterates the temperature structure of the disk until thermal, local thermal equilibrium is established. Then it takes uh, photon packets characterized by the star's properties and it sends them through the disk to simulate how this object would look if we observed it from a particular angle and orientation around it. When I find a model that provides a good fit to the data, I produce a simulated image um, of the disk. And this is the resulting model image generated from the best fit model for HD283571. The grayscale has been inverted so that the brightest parts of the image are actually in black rather than white. Um, what we're seeing here is the central star shown in black. We've got the illuminated inner edge of the disk, and in particular, this side of the disk is on the far side of the star relative to the observer. And meanwhile, the near side of the disk is self-shadowed, so we don't see a corresponding illuminated wall on this side. That There's a real lack of emission. It's, it's shadowed. And what our models really show us is that between the star and the disk is a cavity, which is completely devoid of solid material. Uh, this provides us with a lower limit to the radius at which rocky planets or the solid cores of gaseous planets can form in situ. For HD283571 in particular, this distance is about 0 0.2 astronomical units, which, without going into the detail of that unit, is, is about half the size of the orbit of Mercury. And Mercury is the innermost planet in our solar system, so we've got something kind of comparable to what we see around our own sun. So that's where I'd like to leave things. I hope that's given you an overview of some of the hardware and the software we use and develop as astronomers, and some of the challenges that we have to overcome in designing our tech. Most importantly, I hope I've emphasised the following. That the colour of an object in space is related to its temperature. That we need to use longer wavelengths than our eyes can see and, and detect to understand and study circumstellar disks that scattered light imaging allows us to look at disks on solar system size scales by making use of the polarized um, light produced by scattering off the disk. To probe the main planet forming regions, we have to use interferometry. And in particular, I hope I've shown you that the way that work is quite frankly, just magic. If you're interested in finding out more about my research, uh, you'll find more information on my webpage, which is at cldavisastro.github.io, and that's found in the bottom half of the screen. Thank you very much for listening. I'll take any questions now. Thank you very much, Claire. That was very, very interesting. Really, really good. Oh! <laughs> very welcome. So yeah, really, really good, Claire. I think that was really, really well articulated and very, very clear. Um, I'm just going to say if there's any uh, questions that you'd like to, to answer or anything that you'd like to elaborate on particularly, if there's any areas of interest that you think could be good. Does anybody have any questions? I, I know uh, Jim Ovens asked earlier, um, why do we use or why do we build very large telescopes or extremely large telescopes if we can use interferometers? I, I hope the talk kind of illustrated that, that there's um, two problems. We have the idea that, um, uh, yeah, we have, um, we don't sample the entire image. So our interferometric observations take a, a long time compared to just 
opening the aperture of a telescope, taking an image, closing the aperture. Um, and the other is, um, I suppose from a technical standpoint, we can't really uh, logistically in increase the number of telescopes beyond six that we have uh, at Chara uh, very easily. Um, in addition to the telescopes, you also need lab space to account for the differences in the, the, the light travel path between the object and the telescopes. Um, so you, I think Chara has like a 300 meter or 200 meter lab, which has just got vacuum tubes uh, for the light to come through. And there's mirrors in those vacuum tubes to account for the difference in light travel path and make sure that some of the beams of light travel less distance in the lab than others uh, to account for this uh, so that we actually get our, our fringe packet in our, in our detector. Yeah, the, the software data processing is more convoluted. Yeah, there's a lot of wizardry that goes behind the scenes, hence the, hence the referring to, to it being a, a, a magic, really. Um, yeah, uh, I, can, I can see a, another question about uh, whether Starlink satellites will impede ground-based interferometry. So I think, I think from an interferometric perspective, uh, we'll be fairly robust against Starlink satellites and, and any other um, uh, of the massive constellation satellites that they've decided to put up um, for telecommunications. Um, because we're looking at such tiny areas of the sky, uh, we'll probably just be insensitive to them passing through um, in very, very quickly. Uh, but uh, other ground-based methods are really impacted. So the, uh, the, the UK astronomy's um, kind of interaction with these individuals or, or, or groups such as SpaceX or Tesla, whatever Elon Musk is termed for these as, as Starlink satellites is overarching company anyway. Um, our interaction is, uh, is dominated by the Royal Astronomical Society and the UK SEDS um, or UK Astronomy um, and, and they're looking into ways of kind of making them uh, less reflective um, so that they're not as bright, uh, but they're already um, damaging the, the capabilities of, of, of ground-based uh, astronomy, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> uh, th thanks for the comment. It, it's also nice to see some uh, um, well, it's also nice to be an astronomer talking to you who's not a bloke as well. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I appreciate that a lot of the people talking about astronomy on the TV uh, are, are blokes, particularly Brian Cox, who isn't even an astronomer, he's a particle physicist. So, Or, or comedians, yeah, Dara Breen for one, yeah. Um, so, uh, what is the time scale of going from starting the interferometry reading to getting the final graph image? Um, so those data that I showed you, uh, the visibility versus the, the baseline separation, um, they, they were observed uh, back in uh, August last year, I think. And really we can do a, 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 quick, uh, a quick pipeline that runs just, um, well, I, I say overnight has been from the UK because these are observed in California, but of course the observations are taking place overnight in California. So <laughs> after the observations are finished, after the end of the night, the, uh, there's just a, a, an automatic data reduction pipeline that I've written um, which goes through the data and produces um, a snapshot of the data. Uh, we can then go through and kind of tweak that to get the, the best results out, but we can get a, a first idea of what that, that graph should look like um, in a matter of hours um, after, after the observations have taken place. It's then maybe a couple of weeks worth, actually just at work even, sorry, just uh, fine tweaking um, some of the um, parameters of that pe pipeline in order to get the the, the best signal to noise and um, remove any any um, data artifacts um, as well. Um, there's also a question about what about space-based interferometry? Um, what's that in ref reference to? Sorry, and uh, Nick, add a bit of clarification as to what that's asking. Uh, okay, so forthcoming space-based interferometric missions. Uh, so there's a few. Um, so the, the people who are doing interferometry uh, who are detecting or trying to detect gravitational waves 
um, so a different area of interferometry, not the one that I just spoke to you about. Uh, they're looking to put a um, an interferometer in, in space, um, and that would be well well away from the Earth and Moon. It's it's in what's called the the L two point. Um, so it's a, it's a stable orbit at the same distance um, or rough distance from the sun as the Earth is, but in a different part of the orbit. Um, so it doesn't move, it's kind of just stationary. Um, and uh, from a from an optical interferometry perspective, which is what I've just spoken about, uh, the nearest we get to any kind of space-based um, plans is to have an idea about going to the other side of the moon. Um, but to, to say that those are plans is exaggerating things a lot. Um, I, I think, you know, there, there's, there's small discussions at the moment um, and kind of pathfinding ideas um, just to, to see whether the concept would be feasible. Because um, then if you have an interferometer on the far side of the moon, you can obviously um, observe for a lot longer um, than you can do um, if it was... Um, on the Earth, because you don't have the same day-night cycle, you'd have a, a monthly cycle of observations instead. Um, but but also you don't have an atmosphere to look through. Uh, so one of the things I didn't explain in the, in the talk is that um, your observations, uh, their sensitivity is is or yeah, the brightness sensitivity is dependent on the atmospheric conditions above your telescope. Um, so this is one of the reasons why the telescope is built in California. Because uh, they have nice um, streamlined atmosphere over the top, it's not like the the cloudy conditions we have in Exeter today. Um, uh, so they're able to look through less atmosphere and a, a more stable atmosphere in order to see fainter stars. And of course, you don't have that problem if you can put your interferometer on the moon or or otherwise in space. Yeah. Uh, I will be. Uh, kicking about here and there. I have some work to do this afternoon, um, but I will be kicking about during the conference. So if you want to ask me any more com uh, questions, um, I'm happy to either receive a, a, a poke on, on Twitter um, and I'll, I'll come back online and we can have a discussion um, or you're, I'll be monitoring the, the, the chat in, in this session as well during the day. Um, so you can always come back to this session, drop a question in and I'll, I'll try and answer it. So. Thank you very much, Claire. I was going to say the sessions don't really close, so there's no real hurry if you want to jump from one to another. Um, it's totally up to you. If you want to come back into the session at a set time, then you can come back and do that as well. So yeah, thank you very, very much. We're, um, we've got some networking coming up at 11.30, so I will, I will leave you to it. But if there's anyone else that wants to stick around and ask Claire some questions, but um, otherwise, we'll see you in other areas during the day. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very Bye much. Yet. Bye. I'll uh, I'll switch the video off and the audio off, but I'll stay in the chat for a little bit cool. and at least that's, until eleven. Yeah, that's absolutely fun. There's no there's no rush at all. If everyone wants to just put their questions in there, I mean, you can put your Twitter in there as well if you want to just send any info over. But we will. Sure. Um, yeah, we'll see you about. Thank okay. you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks again.